Hello. Hi. Hi, friends. Hi. Time to settle in. <laughs> Welcome to the Mill Valley Historical Society first Wednesday speaker event presentation, an event we host on the first Wednesday of every month. This is our very first live outdoor event. And the, and, the, and the first live event we've had since March of 2020. And after sitting out here waiting for everyone with this, I, I don't think I'll ever feel the same way about an indoor event. Could, could there be any place more beautiful to gather and to talk about and to enjoy Mill Valley. My name is Deborah Schwartz, and I am director of this speaker series and our oral history program. Both programs are in collaboration with the Mill Valley Public Library. Tonight's presentation is titled Mill Valley, the song heard round the world. And our guest speaker is Rita Abrams. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Also with us tonight is Jeff, Jack Pendergast, who is providing much needed audio technical support. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. And I also want to thank Garth and David right there for helping us to set up some chairs. <laughs> Before we begin, I want to say to you, the audience who are already members of the Mill Valley Historical Society, thank you for your generosity and your interest. The Mill Valley Historical Society membership allows us to continue our efforts to infuse history into the present through speaker presentations such as tonight, oral interviews, history walks, history plaques, and the collaboration to restore and return to Mill Valley engine number nine the last remaining locomotive from the Mount Tamalpais Scenic Railway. For those of you who are not yet members, please join us. You can join, there's membership forms up there at the table. When you become a member, you will hear about future talks such as tonight's. You'll get emails about our annual walk into history that we just had last week that takes place on Memorial Weekend every year. You'll receive Chuck Oldenburg's charming Mill Valley history vignettes via email. And you'll be updated about our events and other events in the county. <coughs> Membership to the Historical Society is so affordable. I mean, compared to everything else these days, more and more affordable. So we welcome your membership and we hope that you will join. Tonight's talk will last about an hour and then after we'll take time for questions and comments and sharing from the audience. This event is being recorded and will be available on the Mill Valley Historical Society website. Just go to the events, select first Wednesday lecture series and you'll find tonight's recordings as well as so many others. What can I say about tonight's guest? Frankly, she's a Mill Valley icon. Rita Abrams, you know, I've done a fair amount of research since tonight's event. And I've learned, you know, as a historian, I think it's really important to learn the backstory about things, the genesis of what came before what we're studying about now. And this I learned about Rita. She loves music. Oh, really? <laughs> As a graduate student in Boston, she had just three records. The Loving Spoonful, Tim Harden, and Knob Lick Upper 10,000. Now hold that thought. <laughs> we'll revisit the significance of her musical preferences later. In 1968, Rita moved to Mill Valley after accepting a position as teacher for Strawberry Point Primary School. Her prior dreams of a musical career were shelved as she happily settled into her new life. 
Then, as we all know, one fateful day, she felt compelled to write a little song about her new hometown, and the rest is history. A composer of musical comedy, Rita's awards include two Emmys, CBS Record of the Year, ASCAP, Gold, Sony Gold Record, and Associated Press Best Video. Her theater honors, with thanks to her many collaborators, include four San Francisco Bay Area Theater Critics Circle Awards for the U.S. premiere of Pride and Prejudice, the musical Aftershocks, New Wrinkles, and For Whom the Bridge Tolls, and a Theater Bay Area nomination for Best Original Musical for Ross Valley Players, Just My Type. Rita's Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus musical was a top 10 best new show in the Las Vegas Review Journal. And it all started with one little song about Mill Valley. Please, won't you give a warm welcome to Rita Abrams. <laughs> welcome, Rita. Thanks, Deborah. I think we should stop there. <laughs> no, I, I want to thank you all for coming. It is really heartwarming to see you all. Um, even those of you I don't know personally, <laughs> I keep seeing, oh, oh my God. <laughs> wow. That's Bruce, right? Bruce? Oh my God. Bruce, it's wonderful to see you. you. I'll introduce you to everybody in the album, but Bruce is a very special person who is right there, this little face. <laughs> I'm so happy to see him. And is Jerry Norton here? Jerry, hi. I thought maybe you weren't here. And is your mom here too? She couldn't make it. Oh, sorry. Day, she had else to do. Anyway, Jerry's the one, this cute little guy, who, when we when we made the record, shot by Francis Ford Coppola, which you can see on YouTube, um, there was this adorable little guy wearing a red fire hat, and everybody was so taken with him in the in the in the fire hat, and I'm very disappointed that you're not wearing it tonight, <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> But you look good anyway. Anyway, it's wonderful to see some of the singers, and some of them wanted to be here but couldn't. And um, what else can I say? Anyway, I'm happy to see you all, and especially some of the old teachers that I taught with Jim Derrich. And we were a group of new teachers who thought we had to be on the straight and narrow, and the girls came with their hair and little buns. And, and then we read the the little syllabus by the principal who was, I mean, by the superintendent, and it said at the bottom, bodily contact is encouraged. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're a teacher or were a teacher in Mill Valley. Don Klein, Jim Derrich, Barbara, his wife, and, and you, you taught in Mill Valley, Robin? I didn't know. Okay. That's right. Okay, anyway. This is very exciting and very, and then, well, I can't name everybody in the audience that I love, but I, so I'll just say I love you all. Okay. You ready okay. to get started? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so you have described, first question, well, segue. You have described, Rita, your life as something out of a fairy tale. And after doing a fair amount of research in preparation for tonight's talk, I have to agree with you. So let's begin your story with, once upon a time there was a teacher. Yeah, speaking to the thing, there was? There was a neurotic Jewish girl. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she channeled her energies well. But there is so many, appears to be fateful things that happened that I'm going to hold that thought as we go through the question and answers. But let's take you back to before you came to Mill Valley, when you were in graduate school. You love music, but you only have three albums. And they were... were the ones you mentioned. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So The Love and Spoonful, Tim Harden, 
And the other one, which I had not heard, that the, the Knoblik Upper 10,000, it was a, yeah, like a bluegrass group. Yeah, out of the Midwest. And it just happened that they were all produced by the same person. No, and they, no, they featured the same person. And um, that was Eric Jacobson, who then became a producer and, and then became the one. So we'll go to him okay. later. But again, there's, when we're talking about magic and the swirling of things, it begins that far back. And then you come to California. Uh, what inspired you to come to California? And how did you arrive? And what year was that? I think it was, well, it was 1968. I lived in Boston. I went to school there to, you know, different colleges there and, and did a master's program at, finally, at um, Boston University. Boston, as I said, loved Boston. It's an amazing city. But after a while, the, the, the sooty, gray snow started getting to me. And um, I, had a, I had a girl's rock band back then called the Three Faces of Eve. And um, we practiced a lot. We didn't get that many gigs, but we, we did practice. And I was, did that while I was teaching pre-kindergarten. And then one of my bandmates, Randall Clark, who was a bass player, she and I decided it was just time to go. You know, it was California dreaming time. And so I bought this, this unbelievably rickety old Volkswagen bus. It was a miracle that it got us out here. That's the real miracle of my life, that bus. <laughs> and so she and I came across country. We, you know, first we ended up in LA where my brother lived. And, um, and then after a while, I wanted to come north to San Francisco. And Randall decided that she wanted to go back to nursing school. And um, in Ann Arbor, and so I came up on first four cylinders, then three cylinders, then two cylinders, and then I ended up in San Francisco on one cil one cylinder, on my Volkswagen bus. And so I had to stay overnight at some um, the humanist organization's um, mansion in San Francisco. And I was desperately searching. I got here much later than I expected to, and I was I was hi Karen. The famous Karen Drucker has just arrived. <laughs> Another fantastic musician and good friend. Um, so I, um, I was late um, applying for a teaching job. And I, I found a place in called Fremont. And they offered me a job. And I thought, it's a job. I, it had, there's a salary. I should take it. But there was one more place on my list that I found on a map, and that was Mill Valley. And just the name, that's all I knew, Mill Valley. And I thought, it was a Friday afternoon. I had, I had an appointment with the superintendent. And it turned out that the kindergarten teacher had decided to go to stay in Mexico. And thanks to her, I, um, I got the job. And when I drove into town for the interview, I, I drove that same route today, and I looked up, and I, I was recalling what that was like to see the, this mountain and these beautiful trees. Mill Valley is still beautiful, thanks to all the people who have kept it that way. It's really still beautiful, and um, and so I, you know, there was no way to say no to this job. But in the interview, he said, um, Jim Collins, who all you new teachers, we all knew him. He was so amazing. And, uh, and he had a jug band in Berkeley, which I didn't know. And, and uh, he said, there's one thing that concerns me about your interview. He said, you didn't mention music. And I said, music, I am music. <laughs> and so that was that. And I had the job. And that's, that was the beginning of it all. Proves the point of a song, California Dreaming. I mean, it compelled you to California, and yeah. then your song compelled people to Snow Valley. Kind of right. funny. Right. Okay, so you made a big shift. You moved across country. You set aside your personal musical aspirations in many ways to become a teacher to little children. How did that feel to leave those aspirations behind? The aspirations of music? Yes. Uh, 
it was really fine. And, and I had been teaching in East Boston, and, and there were bars on all the windows. And Don Klein, can you recall the name of the principal that I had in East Boston? Because he never stopped saying that name. Immaculata <laughs> My principal in East Boston's name, <laughs> very Immaculata good, was Livornia. Immaculata Livornia. Oh and she was, I, I won't use any adjectives, but, but horrific to say the least. And, um, and, but I, you know, I love teaching those kids, but there were, it, it was like a dungeon. The school was like a dungeon. And, um, and when I came out here, it was like heaven, paradise. It was just amazing. And um, did you have another question? About no, that? no. It, it's it, you. So you readily and happily segued into your new life. Yeah. In California. Yeah. Well, I was I was very happy doing music with the kids. Yeah. I mean, teaching little kids is for me. It was all about music. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't I wasn't missing anything, and I got really tired of even in that short time I was the grind of it, we, we had almost had a record deal, the, the Three Faces of Eve, and, and the drummer was a, this girl who had did another album for them. But then when the record producers found out that we were left-leaning, they were not interested in producing us anymore. So that was it for our career. Versus you come to California and the curriculum it says encourage children to touch. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. So we got right. a little temperature change there in many ways. So let's talk about that fateful Christmas day when you were inspired to write the song. Yeah. Just not too far from where we sit right now. This is going to invoke Don Klein again, as will much of the story. But anyway, the Christmas Day, 1969, I had been teaching in Mill Valley a year. And I was just very, very happy there, here. And, um, and I was walking across what now is the plaza, but then it was the, the Greyhound bus depot. And, um, and I just had this thought that this town should have a song about it. And I would write it simply enough. I had written songs throughout my life, by the way, and poems from the time I was a little girl. And um, so I decided that this song should be simple enough that the kindergartners should sing it. And so um, I wrote, I sat down on a bench by the depot and I, I wrote the song and um, just about finished it. And, I, and another reason I was feeling so good was because I wasn't alone on Christmas day. I was going to my dear friends, Don and Susie's for dinner and really looking forward to it. So I got to their house for Christmas dinner. We were all Jewish, of course. And um, <laughs> they have the best kinds of Christmas dinners. And, and, um, and so I, I said somewhere in the evening, I wrote a song about Mill Valley, but it's so schmaltzy that I'm embarrassed to sing it for you. So, of course, they encouraged me to sing it. They never said, oh no, that's not schmaltzy. <laughs> Apparently it was schmaltzy. But, and then, and, and, and then, I don't want to go ahead too long without yeah. consulting with Deborah. <laughs> She's very and, organized. Yes. Um, and then, and then fate happens. You meet a record producer. Right. So, and the, his name is Eric Jacobson. Right. And he's a force, a, a big personality. So let, let's talk about that. I mean, of all the people for you to meet, three albums. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it definitely was a, a serendipitous situation. And, and he was at some party in, in um, Sausalito. He was sitting there in the corner looking very brooding. And, um, and uh, someone said to me, that's Eric Jacobson, the producer. He produced The Love and Spoonful and Tim Harden. And, you know, and, and he played on that Nobla Cup or 10,000. He was a banjo player at the time. And so um, I, I got uncharacteristically aggressive when it came to pr promoting my... I know that Jack is laughing at this. <laughs> He's seen that side of me that comes out when I'm trying to promote one of my records. But I, I, I didn't make the connection at all at the time, but I just, I knew he was a big deal. And I just saw the Turks up there. 
Did you see that? Yep, they're there. The Chirks. <laughs> Do you all know the Chirks? Yes. We have their oral histories. Give the Chirks a big hand. They just had a very significant birthday anniversary. They're wonderful. Okay. And um, back so, to Eric. yeah, so back to Eric. So anyway, I told him that I had, I had written, a, I had written, a, just written a song with kids. I was a teacher, and he said, "Oh, Normie, who was Norman Greenbaum? He was just producing Norman Greenbaum's album, and um, he hadn't done Spirit in the Sky yet." And he said, he wants to put kids on his album. And so uh, he said, send, make a tape and send it to me. So, so I did. I made a tape at, at, at the school on the old web core tape recorder. And my teacher's aide, Tommy Two-Tone, who was, uh, Tommy Heath was his real name. And then he became Tommy Two-Tone. And he became a big star with Jenny five six five whatever it was, eight six seven five three zero nine Jenny. And um, so, uh, we made a demo and with the kindergartners, and they were very cute, but it was pretty horrific. And, um, and then the amazing, th I was going to send it to Eric, but then I was at the, I was at La Genestra with some friends um, a few weeks later, and there was Eric sitting alone, so I went up to him and I said, um, I made that. I made that tape, and he said, "I never listen in person. Send it to me." And I said, "But I live just around the corner. It's walking distance." And uh, so he said, "Okay." So he came over and listened. And and it's a long story that I don't have to. But anyway, he was turning pages, and he never looked up. And I, he was what, reading the National Geographic, and and four times through the National Geographic after I played it four times and was very embarrassed because it sounded so amateurish, he said, I like it, let's do it. And, and then we did, we did the record. But when we actually finally finished, the, we, we recorded it in the kindergarten room and he brought all his musicians in there and it was very exciting and the kindergartners were as adorable as they could be. Uh, but... Uh, I, I, and I didn't hear from him, so I thought, oh, that, okay, of course, that couldn't possibly have happened. It was all a dream. Um, but then I, then I uh, ran into him at and one of these hippie things on Mount Tam. Uh, it was like the Love and Spoonfuls. Uh, no, it was um, the Frank Werber, Kingston Trio's big party on Mount Tam. Everybody was completely stoned. And, and I ran into Eric, and he said, Rita, I listened to the tape. Oh, this is this is the finished product that that he had done, you know, that he had created in the in the in the kindergarten. And he said, and it sounds awful. <laughs> so I just died on the spot. You know, I thought that's it. That's my big career. Okay, I like teaching kindergarten. It's all right. And 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 then, but I didn't know that he never gives up on anything. So he said. Here's what we should do. This was later. He called and he said, "Here's what I want to borrow a third grade class from the school. They're just the right age. They're they're not screaming like the kindergartners. They can sing, <laughs> right, Bruce?" <laughs> and um, he was totally right. They were perfect. They were absolutely perfect. And this is only part of the whole group that sang on, on the Mill Valley song, by the way. That was the entire class. Then we had to weed some out, um, which wasn't as painful as it would, would sound um, for, the, for the album because it was just too many kids. But for, for Mill Valley, they were all, they were all on the album. And, and at that time, we went into the, we went into the um, Wally Hyder recording studio, and we did it professionally, and you know we did tracks. And... and should I go on? <laughs> We're going to pause because I, I interviewed Eric several times before this evening's talk. I really wanted to understand where he was coming from. What did he see? I mean, it's a pretty hokey song. This is a time where there's <laughs> rock and roll. He's released some, he's found and created these amazing stars in many ways. And I asked what his process was. So I'd like to share that to kind of 
enhance what's going on. I, I said, why did you choose to do this? And he did, he did, he confirmed what she said. He did not like to listen to people's music. He, everybody wanted him to listen to a recording. But he said, Rita's very convincing. <laughs> <laughs> About certain things. Yes. He said that it was very unlike anything he was doing. And he had to listen very carefully. I, Rita had told me the, the story of him appearing to be reading this magazine while he keeps asking her to play it again and again. And he said he had to listen to it very carefully and several times to take it in. That He felt it. He was waiting to see his emotional response to the music. He was intrigued. And he said, I liked it. And he liked Rita, too. And they became friends. So he paid for it with his own money. He believed in the project, he said. And he took the chance. He said he, he, he knew that you could not buy the sound that was coming from her classroom. You would, couldn't find musicians that bad, <laughs> but that the sound was very good. And uh, I, I encouraged him to go on, and he said it, it wasn't a big deal that he'd always made records with unknown artists. That's what he did. And he made hits with unknowns, and that he'd never worked with kids before, so this was all new for him. And this is how it came to be. Mm -hmm. And he says, um, in retrospection, it's, it's different looking back than forward, that it was a very good experience and fun. And he got to work with a kind of paintbrush situation that he'd never experienced before or since. And only once did he ever lose his temper. And I'll never forget it. <laughs> he said, Rita is an artist, after all, and a little nudgy. But he'd rather have that than a guy not show up or be high on heroin. <laughs> and... Um, and so from a paintbrush style, he said from an artistic point, um, they, when he played Norman's record, he played Spirit in the Sky at this, in the same meeting that he, played, um, that he played Mill Valley. And when he played Spirit in the Sky, they gave it a smattering of polite applause. Which was a the song that's hit. one of the biggest hits in the world. Um, and then when he, when they played Mil, when he played Mill Valley, they stood up, the men in the business suits, and they gave it a standing ovation. And, and it was a, it was seven it was ten days before school was out, and it immediately went. They distributed it all over the world. So while I was still teaching, um, they you know people were calling the school from all over the place and checking to make sure there was a real. Rita Abrams, a real Miss Abrams, and it was a real class, a real school, and and so forth. People were very cynical and skeptical, but um, and it just went, just caught on. And and I think Deborah, you got a quote from him about it being a turntable. Yes, hit. he said uh, it became a turntable hit and a commercial failure. So that means turntable hit means that. People are calling the radio station and asking to play. Remember back then, with AM and FM, you could request songs. Usually, and this is the only time this has ever happened in his career as well, usually when it's a turntable hit, it's a commercial hit as well. The album sells. But it was not an album seller. Well, that, uh, that was, Mill Valley was the single at first, yes. yeah. Yes, yeah. so and it was a surprise. The song is filled with surprises and unexpected. Yeah. And, and Joel Selvin, who was quite a cynic, and he was the rock music critic, and, and he called it, a, he said, that fluke hit, Mill Valley. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, it was enough of a hit that, that, that Warner Brothers decided to go for the album. And um, they put out this really wonderful album, I have to say. Um, and... Jack has it on. Maybe we can play some of it later, but uh, he might. It might come through the speakers. Some of, and um, this was again by the time we made the album. 
we and and by the way the the oops um, the single had brought so much publicity with it that it was unbelievable and and one of the reasons I wanted to have this event was because I I look forward to hearing stories and we were making sure that we were going to have enough time to hear some of your stories about you know either when you heard it or where you were in the world when you heard it but um, it was it was pretty pretty phenomenal and we were in Life magazine and um, yeah, we're gonna yeah. go I've got a whole list of, oh, okay. of what happened with <laughs> okay. that song we'll get to that I want to know about Francis Ford Coppola making the film how did that happen? That was kind of an afterthought because, um, well, uh, Deborah's talking about the film that's on YouTube now. It's been there for many years. And um, on July 4th of 1970, we're, there was a big party of Mill Valley on the town square in Mill Valley. And they asked us to, to have the kids and me to come and, and sing. And I think we sang to the track, right, Bruce? We, yeah. And I was pretending to play the guitar, and uh, and so that film, it turned out I had no idea, and I didn't know at the time anyway. But but Warner Brothers hired it was for quote foreign exploita exploitation of the film, of the song, and uh, so Warner Brothers hired this young up and coming filmmaker named Francis Ford Coppola. <laughs> who at the time lived just like right over there. You could almost see his house from here on Laurel, Laurel Grove or something. And, um, and I didn't know any of that. But in much later, after it was, after it was out and, and the, film, the little film and the video, music video, and it was on YouTube, I guess, at that time, or just starting to be. And, and then someone said to me, about mentioned that Francis Ford Coppola had made the film and I said I had no idea because I didn't meet him during that process at all so and then after that we went on the Smothers Brothers and we were on some TV shows and uh, they used the film because the kids were not union so they couldn't have the kids on there <laughs> some of the other shows you were on was what's my line were you on 60 Minutes, too? Uh, never on 60 Minutes and never on What's My Line. Okay. But other than that, you're Your correct. name is. <laughs> no, uh, I was on To Tell the Truth. Oh, it was To Tell the, the real, Truth. Will the real Rita Abrams please stand yes, up? Yes, right. That's it. All these people are way too young to have ever seen that show, though. <laughs> and then there's On the Road with Charles Corral in CBS in 1970. The CBS, yeah, yes, that, that was the, then it became the CBS record of the year. Yes. Yeah. And uh, KQED's forum with Michael Krasny. Yeah, and Bruce was there for that. Yeah. We were on that show. You were on, had us on Life magazine, Newsweek magazine. Right. Rolling Stone, were you in Rolling Stone? Yeah, yeah. What in fact, we were the first subject that Annie Leibovitz photographed um, and her long career with Rolling Stone. She was an 18-year-old photographer, and um, she came into the classroom, strode in on her long legs, and we had a, a high grand piano that I had painted all different colors of the rainbow, and she jumped up on top of the piano and started shooting down on us, and, and you know, um, it was an amazing- a photo, too. Amazing yeah. picture, yes. yeah. Um, I've interviewed a fair amount of people in this town, and the song comes up frequently. And I thought I'd give a quote from Joe Breeze's uh, oral history. If you know who Joe Breeze is, he's one of the founders of mountain biking. And here is from his interview from several years ago. He's talking about a road trip he took with his brother on the bike. And it, he says, but as I recall it, I had just ridden that summer this 1,400-mile bike ride. And I was in pretty good shape, right? A hundred miles a day for 14 days. My brother got some flat tires. He always seemed to be getting flat tires to end rides. And we hitchhiked when that happened. He lost the needle to sew up his sew up tires by Fort Bragg. And these guys, these kids from Los Angeles, I don't know, they were 16, probably 17 years old or 18, not even. And they came along in a VW bus. And we hung out. They picked us up and we spent the night with them out on the beach. And we had just this great time and we went to the Navarro River and swam and they took us down the coast. The song Mill Valley by Rita Abrams had come out 
and they wanted us to give us a ride all the way to Mill Valley so they could hear those kids singing. <laughs> they didn't know that Joe was from Mill Valley. It was, he says it was a huge hit, actually. And in 1971, when I rode through Europe, that song was on the radio. He says, yeah, Mill Valley, that's my home. Oh my gosh, it was a worldwide hit. And that's what brought a lot of people to Mill Valley, perhaps. I don't know. But those two boys, they needed to hear that song. It's so funny. It's a very sweet story. How many languages was the song translated into? Um, I only have one recording of a little Swedish star, a child star named Anita Hegerland, and she, I have a recording of her doing it in Sweden, mm -hmm. in Swedish, uh, that and the happiest day of my life. Um, I don't know if I actually, maybe there was a, a Japanese version, but I never heard it. Yes. So clearly the song and its performers appealed to a surprisingly broad audience. It touched people. People just, you know, clearly when you're looking at it, there's an innocence and a warmth to it. And that, I imagine, brought a different kind of fame. I mean, I've interviewed rock stars and other very slick and famous people, and they're rather unapproachable. Mm -hmm. But you, with this girl-next-door beauty and this <laughs> classroom of children, uh, you have such a wholesome yet sexy image, yeah. in a way. It's kind of like a sexy American Maria von Trapp. Had, had anybody ever? If only I had known that at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> did thank you, Deborah. Like thank you. That's a very, that's very comfortable. I mean, it, because when I look at all the attention, it occurs to me, part of the appeal is that you're so approachable. Everything is approachable. It's attainable. It's not the same kind of distance that can be created with people that are suddenly quite famous. I think that you, it was a different kind of fame. Yeah. Um, how did that attention impact your life and the lives of the students and their families and the school too? Well, the students, we should ask the students. Um, we, of whom we have to. Maybe during sharing time, yeah, you would be yeah. able to, to, to tell us how yeah. it affected you. But, but um, my life, it was, if, if it had gone on any longer, I think I would have needed to check into a mental hospital. <laughs> because it was really heady stuff. And, and all of a sudden, to be, um, to have all this, this you know, attention directed, directed at me it was, and A and R men, you know, picking me up in limos in LA and with flowers and, and I, I, when I was on Smothers Brothers and a couple of the shows and, and, and one of the A and R men said, you know, I was commenting in my, you know, uh, innocent way at the time, you know, about how amazing it is and everybody was treating me so wonderfully. And he said, well, you will be making another record. And when you do, if it's a flop, you'll be amazed at how fast all that will stop. So, <laughs> yeah, that was very true. <laughs> but 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 uh, th there was just one time when um, I, I would literally get dizzy sometimes when people recognize me on the street. I because you would see people's eyes; they don't look at you like a human being. They look at you like some kind of a thing. It and it it. It was both exciting to be a star temporarily, and it was also really unsettling. And um, yeah, so it was, it was a mixture. What has been the most meaningful for you through all of this? Well, actually, what's happening here today has been the most meaningful because, <clears throat> I mean, the fact that the song went on for so long, so many years. It's been 53 years now since the song came out. It came out in 1970. And um, it's, it's an incredible phenomenon. And, and, the way, and the letters, the letters that we've gotten, you know, that, that you know, uh, incredible fan mail, starting when they didn't even have, you know, when you couldn't go online, they started coming to the, some people just wrote 
to Rita Abrams, Mill Valley, and I got those letters back then. They were actual letters. And, um, <laughs> and, but just the fact that the song meant so much and the messages that I've gotten and of how it's touched people, how it affected people. And Deborah, I don't know if you're going to read that yeah, one. I, I'm actually going to read a couple of Unbelievable letters. things. I mean, I mean life-changing experiences pe that people recorded just because of the innocence of the song. Um, and it's so wonderful to me that, that it has survived. I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm just thrilled that it has and that it's, you know, tonight, it brought us all together tonight, and which is a very lovely thing. There are over 510 comments in the YouTube video that I saw, and there are more than one post in the video. Um, I would like to read a couple of messages from some men. Uh, interestingly, there's a lot of comments from men. Uh, and this is from a vet. It was in the later 1970s that I got to listen to your music from your Miss Abrams album. I never knew what an impact it made on me. Then in 1991, I was in a foxhole and running around the desert, and I was scared beyond my means and to no wit's end. I would close my eyes and part my mind, and I would hear Mill Valley come into it. In a little bit, I was again at peace. One day, I hope to thank you for not only bringing me beautiful music, but a calm in a dangerous time. I have never known. Even today, I fight with severe PTSD, but your songs bring me peace inside of me. I can only remember the words through, through my heart. Sadly, I lost the vinyl record and I cried because this is the music I loved. I thought to myself, if only I could have this album, and even if it was just your signature and not the other performers on the album, I would cherish this until my dying breath. Again, thank you for an island of peace in my hardship. God bless Robert Worthington, Seattle, Washington. Here's another one. In 2008, he writes, Miss Abrams, I heard your song Mill Valley in 1970 at an Armed Forces Vietnam radio station while serving in the Army in Yang Trang, Vietnam at the time. I'm 60 years old now, but still have fond memories of the song. I read a magazine article about you years ago and found your website tonight while burning a CD of some golden oldies. oldies. While many of us have unfortunate memories of that, area, that era, my memories of the song are one of the good memories. Wishing you well, Jack Williams. And here's one from Sandy Kay. Oh, the flooding memories. I was the same age as these kids when this was recorded, living in Santa Clara, California. Growing up in an entirely dysfunctional, alcoholic household was about as far from wholesome as one could get. All I could think of, mired in the torrent of physical and emotional violence, was how to escape for one more day. What was my salvation? Locking myself in my closet with a tiny portable turntable playing this 45 RPM single over and over. This little record held more power to protect me in my young mind than one might expect. Can you imagine not feeling safeguarded by the sweet melody of happy kids and their smiling teacher? Thank you, Miss Abrams, for sharing this then and now. I won't ever forget you or those kids. And that was just last week that I got that, that letter, by the way. And here's one. They the keep beginning. coming. This is one when COVID first hit. And this will be the last one I read. Last night I was up late, unable to sleep. And as a 72-year-old single dad raising my 10-year-old granddaughter, scared to death of what this new coronavirus might do to our lives. I had already turned off the news, which wasn't helping. I decided to go find something uplifting, something to make me feel better. And up pot popped a thought about a song I used to sing with my kids, Jessica and Josh, when we lived in West Marin. I still marvel, Rita, at how you and Eric complemented each other's lives. And 
Eric has, was generous with his praise for you. He said he gained respect for your writing. Uh, Pride and Prejudice, Broadway style, he really liked that. Okay. He said Rita's funny and her wit is obvious. Um, he talked about how you've maintained your friendship and that you've stood by him through thick and thin. And he describes your relationship in a singular way and he feels truly that fate brought you together. And when I think about the magic of all this and the magic of community and sharing and what's beautiful and meaningful to us all, part of that fairy tale story comes to mind and, and how this all came to be and to support those very, very thoughts. You are clearly a creative force of nature. Can you please describe the ways in which you've continued your artistic expression throughout your life and in your career choices? Well, I, um, after I stopped teaching, which I felt like I had to do because all these opportunities were coming to me and I thought it would be temporary and I'd return to teaching, but I didn't. And I have regretted that I didn't. Um, but I went into children's music. I was, um, I was invited by Harcourt Brace Jovanovich Publishing Company to be um, an author of children's music and, and that became, became a career with them. And um, I did some commercials which were great for me and for the kids. And uh, so I did, there, was a, there were many years of doing mostly children's music. And then I started doing, writing musicals putting plays to music, and, and um, that became the thing that I felt like I was most meant to do. And so I've been doing that pretty much ever since. And we just finished a really successful run at um, Ross Valley Players of, of, of uh, Pride and Prejudice, the musical. And um, it was very exciting. And, and, you know, the curse of being creative is that I don't know if, if you guys, we have some very creative women, people, men too, I'm sure I know. But um, it, it's like, oh God, do I have to write that? You get an idea and you think, oh no, it's, you know, couldn't I just go to the beach or something? I mean, it, it's hard, it's hard because you have all this in you and it's, it's hard to just let it go. And so finding, and especially at my age, it's, you know, what now? Uh, and I, I, you know, I tell people, I'm, I love to write something new, but it doesn't make sense because plays, you have to get on a stage and the pro it takes, it takes an average or a minimum, I should say, of seven years from get to get from page to stage to get something from page to stage. So, sorry, <laughs> maybe in my next life I can write some more, but now it's about just trying to get what I have out there and, and hoping that I can keep doing that and then finding a balance and I'm working on finding the balance and not being too obsessive about all that. So, so um, in, in the closing of this portion of the presentation, I thought we'd close with some lyrics from one of your favorite songs by The Leaven Spoonful. Oh. Okay. From Do You Believe in Magic? Do you believe in ma- yeah. Do you believe in magic? Yeah. Believe in the magic of a young girl's soul. Believe in the magic of rock and roll. Believe in the magic that you can set free. Yep, talking about the magic. I think they wrote that song about you. <laughs> I don't <laughs> They just so. didn't know it. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, Rita, for thank sharing you, your Deborah. story. Thank and you. now we'll move to the Q&A portion. I'm gonna... <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. I'm gonna hand this over to, to um, Jack, who's gonna tell you how we can take the questions. Yeah. So, so call, come on up to this microphone, and uh, we're not gonna remove the mic. I'll just adjust the height to your height and make your questions brief, succinct, and speak closely into the microphone. We'll see how we do. And questions and sharings as well. Please feel yes. free.
free to share when you first heard the song or your participation in the song. Rita, so after you wrote the Mill Valley song, I would think that you'd be approached by hundreds of other towns to write songs for them. <laughs> Have, did that ever happen? Um, not, not really, but people would suggest, oh, why don't you write a song about San Pedro or Milpitas? And, you know, they didn't understand the, um, the importance of uniqueness and, you know, not selling out and just writing, maybe I can get somebody to pay me to write a song about this town or that town. But, but what did happen was a lot, of, a lot of school districts and kids did parodies of Mill Valley and put in their own song and their own lyrics. And that was very sweet, really. So, yeah. Thanks, Rona. Is Bruce, Bruce? You got a question? Would you like to say anything, Bruce? Well, we got a question. Rita, you got a guy here. We've got Eric Macris, former president of the Mill Valley Historical Society. Thank you. I'd much rather hear from him. But uh, <laughs> I do have a question. Yes. Uh, be close to the microphone. Okay, sure. A uh, question about the demo tapes that you made, early versions of the song, the one you did in the school with the school right. tape recorder, right. the one in the recording studio with the kindergartners, and then the Swedish cover. Do you have copies of those recordings? It'd be great to hear those, too. Uh, well, the Swedish one I had nothing to do with. So th that was done by them in Sweden. And, um, and, and um, yeah, and, I'm just and, wondering how we might be able to hear these things. I love, for example, with Beatles songs, you can hear it go from John Lennon's bedside oh. tape recorder into Strawberry Fields Forever. You can hear how it changed. Interesting. It's interesting to hear yeah. early versions of your song, too. You know, I, you know it is a good question. Um, I, don't, I don't have those. I, I do have some reels of, of, but but they're all of the final one that was done uh -huh. at Wally Hyder's. So, yeah, I'm afraid I don't. Oh, that's too bad. But thank you, <laughs> and thank you for everything you've done for us. I grew up with that song. Oh, you're very so welcome. Thanks, thanks so much. I'm I'm glad you have a history with it too. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Maybe Jerry. Oh yeah, good. We have. Oh good. Bruce and Jerry. Both on the record. Who wants to go first? Uh, this is the boy in the <laughs> fire hat, Jerry. <laughs> they sort of look rather childish coming up to you see the zebra. That's sweet. Jerry, and that's Bruce. <laughs> is, that, is that Mr. Klein over there? And it's Mr. <laughs> Klein. Don. Don was teaching at the time. So, Stop your um, point. We can't hear. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Okay, he's not talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A couple questions. How did Mr. Stalin you pick us? He, he used to roll the uh, piano around to all the different classes. Mr. Don Stahl. Yeah. Yes, right. But how did how did you choose our class? Oh, um, that is a really good question. How did we? How many third graders, third grade classes were there? It might have been two. I think you had a reputation for being the most musical of the two classes. That's what I think. And it was true. Well, um, there was only one? I thought there was two of every class, but anyways. Oh. Um, there was one third grade class. And I was teaching grades two, three, four, and five in one room. That's right. Yeah, Don, Don went back to the old days of the one-room schoolhouse, and he co-taught, you know. Kind of overflow instead of somebody being, Bob Pearson was their teacher. Yeah. If you, I would just trade off the title, recruit kids from my class. Right, right. Oh, and by the way, I must say that when you, when you leave, you'll see the poster outside with the, with the picture of the kids and me. Um, Don took that picture, and it went all over the world. Jerry. Ever hear from Mr. Pearson? No, I never. I asked about him. I heard he was up in the Northwest, but um, I have not. No. Well, I just wanted to say that um, being around you was like, it was like being around, you know, for us kids, it was just fun. We weren't, nobody really bothered us or... We were just having fun. 
but it sounds like you had the, uh, the celebrity stuff going on with you. Yeah, I guess so. Um, but I was having fun with you guys, too. You were, you were a great bunch, just really natural and hilariously funny. Right, Bruce? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, I, um, Jerry. Uh, yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Bruce. Bruce Bennett. And uh, I am sitting here, and I haven't seen you for a while. Uh, Rita, it's been years. Yes. And um, I didn't know how I'd feel when I came into this grove. And whew, so many good memories. So many. Um, I'm, so I'm getting a little, a little emotional. And I don't know why, but it's a good thing. Um, I'm picturing when, uh, during that time, we had a photo shoot. I believe it was in by the old mill um, around this area, and uh, and I'm, I think it was Cindy that had fallen in the water. Yes, right over there. <laughs> yeah, and we had to somehow change her uh, attire, and I think um, we went back to your home. Yeah, yeah. And she wore. Uh, Put on one of your dresses, and that, <laughs> and that was in the the cover of the album. Her wearing your dress, if I recall correctly. And that's. Do um, you think that was it? Yeah. Uh huh. Wow. I think so. Anyhow, it's memories like that. But I have to say that for uh, myself going to school, um, and I think we lasted about two years, maybe with this. Um, the record and everything. And those two years had to be the most important uh, two years of schooling of my life. And, wow. um, so, so many um, incredible uh, moments with you, Rita. Um, I fell in love with you as a nine-year-old. Um, <laughs> looked up to you, and uh, you mentioned before about the, the VW bus. Um, I loved that bus. And I remember you used to let us, um, you would make squares, and we could all pick a color, yeah. and uh, color in the favorite uh, square that we had you know, with our favorite color. And, yeah, on uh, the bus, right? On the bus. Yeah, the bus. The, the funny thing about that bus was that, that, you know, so the bus would, it was not waterproof. And, but, so I would ride, I would drive that bus around and as the season changed and as the colors ran yeah. and it turned into mud and it was just the most, I, I have a picture of it somewhere until the parents of one of the kids from the seminary came, came by and they said, they said, you have got to wash this bus. <laughs> <laughs> and they made, the, they made the janitor, Roy, wash the bus. <laughs> yeah, well, to me, it was the magic bus, definitely, <laughs> definitely. And, and it was um, the same bus. It, 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 they fixed the cylinders. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, it just, uh, uh, so many memories um, come back to me. And, and I do, uh, on occasion, watch that YouTube video. Um, uh, and thank goodness for Francis Ford Coppola for uh, putting that together because uh, he saved a piece of history and uh, I, I share it with a lot of people. Oh, that's and, nice. Um, I tell the story um, a lot yeah. uh, of the song Mill Valley, so the tradition goes on, in, in my opinion. And um, after, when I got older, you gave me kind of the jump start of uh, loving the stage and I acted quite a bit. Um, when I was younger, uh, and I have to say that you instilled that in me, so, um, and the song, and I don't know. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that, Bruce, really. It's, Every teacher's um, most fondest hope. Yeah. <laughs> you and taught I think, me a I lot. Think, I think Jerry would agree that you, Bruce, were made for the stage. <laughs> 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 right, Jerry? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm hearkening back to it, so we'll see what happens. Good, and, oh, I'm glad uh, to hear it. Yeah. Good. Um, well, I thank just want to sharing. say thank you, Rita, yeah. so much. You're very You're welcome. In my heart. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And thank you, Jerry. Any other questions before we? Okay. Remember when we played with uh, Vince Garaldi? Yeah, that was exciting. I didn't appreciate it at the time. Now I'm a jazz fan, and oh, I, nice! I wish you would reintroduce Mill Valley in a jazz format. 
<laughs> I'll put Jack on it because Jack is a jazz player. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Uh, thank you. Hello, Rita. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you again. Yeah, you too. Well, I'm, I'm just one, one year ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sounds really loud. But I'm just one year ahead of your class that got to sing at Strawberry Point. Right. At right. Strawberry Point. Yeah. And um, I just want to say, you look the same as I remember you at school. <laughs> it's your beautiful spirit, and it means so much to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. And how do you stay looking so young? Um, stress agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you. And it was the 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 Willett family. That's right. It was what's your first name again? I, I'm I'm Tammy Willett. Tammy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you had an amazing family. Yeah, I've I've got six cousins and three sisters. Wow. And we all went to Strawberry Point School. And they were all amazing. <laughs> oh, it's so nice to hear from you. Good Love to, you. Good to see you. Thanks. I have a really quick question. The sound effects of the kids yeah. playing. Yeah. Whose idea was that? Uh, that was, I think, all of our idea. I think, I think it was a collaboration with the producer and me. Um, but, but so he just sent the sound man out on the playground, and they just took wild sounds, you know, of all the kids playing, and then just put it in. I think that was huge. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? If anybody else wants to come up and question, also I want to mention that. Uh, Rita has some CDs of the uh, the Strawberry Point fourth grade class with Miss Abrams CD, the actual CD with the Mill Valley song here, ten dollars. If anybody wants to make that part of their collection, I'll have them up here. You can <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Talk to me. I, they're kind of homemade. I just thought if anybody wanted to ha doesn't have a recording and wanted to have it, um, you could have one. But anyway, hi, hi, hi. Um, my question is, the world is so different today legally. What was involved with getting consents and the parent, did the parents get asked if they want to do this? Releases, yeah, there were well, what, releases. And yeah. they, they didn't know it's going to go international, so I just wondered what that picture involved then. That was my question. Yeah, you know, you're probably right. There probably would have been, you know, lawsuits up the wazoo and, you know, and, and what interestingly, it was all very simply handled. I mean, Warner Brothers bought gifts for the, you know, for the kids and for the kindergarten and really nice expensive presents for the school. And, and I think they treated it fine. I mean, um, when, when it got to be, I don't think the kids received any actual cash, did they? Oh, you did receive cash. Oh, good. I didn't, so. <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> but that's a good question. Did you make much money from this? Did you no, make any I, money? I didn't make much money from commercial. Um, from, the, from the single. No, I, I didn't make much money from it. Oh, what it was was kind of a career maker. But, but no, because what, what happened was after, after the CD, after the. Um, the single was was made and became a hit, and then they, they made the album. The way it was done was they put the money, whatever money came from the single, they put back into the album. So, and then the album never recouped its, its expenses. But I would hear from libraries around the country, and you know, the the album still existed. Oh, and then I did get excuse me one second. I just do any of you know John Cordy? I know Robin does filmmaker local but he went really big and he called me up one day and he said I'd like to make um, an animated film out of your album and I was very excited and because it was a really wonderful idea and um, time went on I didn't hear from him and then it turned out that he had just been act, asked to, to film the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman with Cicely Tyson which won and Emmy and other things, and that was it. That that opportunity was gone. Anyway, hi. Hi, Rita. Hi. I'm Phyllis, and our family moved to Mill Valley in the summer of 1970. Oh. And we had camped our way across the country. Wow. And that song, your song, became kind of kind of our family theme song. And you know, Amazing. wherever we would go. We, that's where we live. That's, oh. that's our song. Oh. Thank you. Rita. That is really nice. <laughs> nice to hear. Thank you, Phyllis.
That's wonderful. Thank you all for being here this evening. Um, thank you, Rita, for everything. Um, and I, thank you, Deborah. Let's give Deborah <laughs> a hand. Yay, Deborah. Good job, Deborah. <laughs> thank you all for being here today. Um, before leaving, I urge you to go check out our selection of books on sale. There is our present Mill Valley Historical Society president, Nancy. And she's, we've got Chuck Olenberg's Mill Valley Vignette Trilogy. We've got Betty Girk's Adventures of Two Miwok Children, which is great for adults and children. Uh, we've got our new 2023 Review Magazine, which is super duper good. And it's, we've got uh, an opportunity for you to join the Historical Society if you haven't already. And next month, we'll be back to Zoom format, which is kind of sad after oh. having this time together. I have to say, um, I've been hosting the speaker series for a very long time, and I've missed you all. Zoom is great, and the recording's great, but it's not this, and it's not in these trees. So I'm very grateful for this evening that we could have this special time oh, well, together and not get perfect. rained on, too, <laughs> like it was happened last month. But we will have, next month, we have invited back uh, one of my favorite speakers, Brian Crawford, to talk about his new book, Lost Islands of San Francisco Bay, which is really, really interesting. You'd think, eh, but it's good. Um, I'd like to think, uh, thanks again to Rita, and to Jack, and to Dave and Garth, and to Nancy, and the Mill Valley Public Library, and to all of you for your interest and your patronage. Good night and be well. Thank you, Deborah. And thanks everybody for coming. And if anybody has anything that you didn't get to say, feel free to email me at ritaabrams at gmail.com. Sing and again, along with us.